Our scripture today is found in 1 Samuel 13 and 14. If you would like to turn there in your Bible. These chapters are long enough that were I to read them, there would be no time to preach. So I am going to assume that you have already read them. Or if you have not, that you will do so later today. And let me instead take the text and highlight the emphasis that address the message today. The internal dynamics of success. Saul was not a success. He demonstrates in these two chapters the internal dynamics of failure. I thought, though, that by demonstrating those principles, we could then flip them and say, if you act oppositely from Saul, then you can find in your life the kind of success that God wants you to have. The first area which finds Saul in failure is that he stepped outside of God's known will for his life. That's the focus of chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. As we enter into that chapter, we've already had an introduction to the person of Saul, the first king of Israel. It's been a favorable introduction. He's come literally out of nowhere. I mean, looking for lost donkeys is about as nowhere as you can get. And he has been promoted to king. He has stepped outside of the shadow of a domineering father which taught him to live a very sub submissive and uh, non-spirited existence. He's had to step out of that and make decisions on his own. He's had to transfer from a background spiritually where he appears to have known very little about God and already the Spirit of the Lord has come upon him and he's prophesied. And he's had to deal with a severe inferiority complex which found him on the day of his public coronation out hiding with the pack animals among the baggage. He's had to step out of that inferiority complex and assume a responsibility of leading a nation at war. Now we find him at a pivotal time. It's still the beginning of his kingship. He's 30 years of age, awfully young age. I mean, we get upset when we hear that a Supreme Court judge is going to be 41. Say, how could such a young man be in such responsible position? God doesn't necessarily appoint people by the chronological years. Saul is 30 and he's king. And in chapter 13, he faces a severe test whether or not he's going to do God's will. That's a test every one of us face. As I read these verses, I must tell you that in my initial and second and third and fourth goings over of the text, I had a difficult time justifying what happened to Saul. I might be just as well frank with you that my initial impression was that Samuel was short on patience and may even here have been misrepresenting God when for such a small act as a disobedience, given Saul's situation, the kingdom is stripped from his dynasty. I mean, go over it with me for just a moment. Here's the situation as it lays. Saul is encamped down at Gilgal, which is down in the lowest spot in the world, 1,200 feet below sea level, in the oasis valley of Jericho, just north of the Dead Sea. Up on the mountains, just as a crow flies seven or eight miles from him, but with sheer cliffs and strongly sloping mountains, there is perched a formidable enemy. Saul has a formidable external threat facing him called the Philistines. They have numerical advantage. They're, they are, as verse 6 says, as the sand of the sea in number. Saul is down to 3,000 troops. 
They not only are numerically superior to him, they are strategically superior. They have the heights. That's still strategic if you're in the Holy Land today. Several years ago, I was in Israel on my own, and one of the things that I did was to sign up for a private car tour by a former defense journalist who took three of us, unknown, we were unknown prior to that to one another, on a two-day tour inspecting the present defenses of Israel vis-a-vis -vis its borders with Jordan and Syria, Lebanon, and the sea. The first thing we did is we headed out of Jerusalem. We headed down toward Jericho, but after only descending a few hundred feet, we made a left turn on an unmarked highway. At least it wasn't marked in English, as most of the highways in Israel are marked in Hebrew and in English. This was only marked in Hebrew. I said to our guide, why is it that that highway is unmarked? It's only in Hebrew. He said, this is the alone highway. It is a public highway, but we don't want the tourists on this highway. It is primarily a military highway. It runs totally along the eastern ridge of the Samaritan mountain range, and constantly below is the valley floor. And as we that day took that ancient highway, we reviewed the five passes through which any invading force from the east must come by land if they are to get into Israel. And whoever has the heights has superiority. Israel has the heights today, and they feel good about that. There are machine guns and all kinds of sophisticated radar and weaponry that are perched at every pass, waiting to intersect any enemy. But the Philistines had those high points. Not only did they have the numbers and the high points, but they had weaponry superiority. They had chariots, 6,000 of them, and 600, or 3,000 chariots, and 600 charioteers. Now, true, chariots aren't going to do you much good in the mountains, but just the psychological knowledge that the enemy's got something we don't is enough to scare you. They've got nuclear weapons, and we don't. That would intimidate you, even if they weren't going to use them. And they also, the Philistines, have the blacksmithing trade. They're skilled in metallurgy. And the Israelis do not know how to smelt down ore and make spears and swords. So in the whole army of Israel, only two guys got a sword or a spear, and that's Jonathan and his dad, Saul. Everybody else is using things like slingshots and clubs. Big deal. Saul has a formidable external opponent. Isn't that the same situation we find ourselves in when we look at the problems of life, the, the problems that hit us are so often greater than the apparent resources we have to deal with them. Those uh, resources on Saul's part were very few. He'd started out with an army of 330,000, chapter 11. Now he's down to a standing army. That, that was, the 330,000 was kind of like Israel's army today. It's on call. Bang, you can assemble 300,000 people like that takes about 24 hours to get them all in place, but the standing army is much smaller. He had a standing army of 3,000, but given what was happening up on the heights and the numerical superiority and the superiority of weaponry, his army had melted down to 600 by the end of a week's waiting, and the few that were still left were hiding in caves among the rocks, and they were even hiding in cisterns. I'm must confess to you, I'm a, little, I'm a little late learner sometimes in life. Until a couple years ago, I didn't know what a cistern was. So for those who have lived as long as I have and didn't know what they were, it's, it's simply a, a device you build to catch and hold rainwater for washing purposes or drinking purposes. You've got to be desperate to hide in a cistern. You've got to be shaking out of your mind with fear. I've been, I saw a cistern in a third world country. I stepped outside of a home and went outside to take a look at the drinking water thinking I might want to drink. I decided after looking at what was floating in that cistern that I did not want to drink. I would have to be pretty desperate to hide in one of those things. They were hiding. His military situation was rapidly deteriorating. And where's Samuel? Samuel has said, I'll be there in seven days. Samuel's going to offer the sacrifice that's appropriate for to commit the nation to battle and seek God's favor. 
All these seven days, Saul is waiting. Samuel said he'd show up within seven days, and he never shows. The situation is getting worse. So finally, after Samuel doesn't keep his word and show up, Saul says, well, something's got to be done or the whole army's going to leave me. So he offers sacrifice. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as he does, Samuel shows up and says, no, you've disobeyed a command of God. The kingdom is stripped from you. Actually, what happened was that Saul continued as king for 40 years. The rejection of him as king meant that he would not have a dynasty to reign. And don't you, in, in, in hearing me recite this, think that that was maybe just a little bit unfair. I mean, it's Samuel's fault. Samuel's the one that's goofed up the whole situation. He's late getting there. And poor Saul has been trying to do his best to keep things together against a formidable enemy. And then he tries to do the one thing he knows that maybe will be all right, and that is commit the nation to God before they go out to battle. And he gets reamed by the prophet for doing something wrong and the kingdom jerked out from his family. Makes you mad at Samuel. And uh, besides, Saul could say, I never asked for this job. It's not fair. Ain't that true in life? Most everything that happens to us that we don't like isn't fair. So we didn't ask for it. <laughs> That's how I read the text. And I said, I can't get up and tell the congregation I disagree with Samuel. I mean, it's only been 3,000 years I realized all that, and it's not a life and death issue for you today, but I said, I can't do that. Because as a person who teaches God's Word, I must be under it. I must not sit in judgment on it. It must sit in judgment on me. So there's something here that I'm missing. Sure enough, there was. And the analogy that I can illustrate or use to illustrate what is missing is this. Saul is in school. He's in training. He's got a professor named Samuel, and he has just completed the first semester of required elementary lessons in being a king. It is now time for an examination a final examination in first semester kingship. Anyone who has ever taken a final exam or given one knows that the purpose of a final exam is to throw something at you that you don't expect but which will nevertheless test whether you have learned that essential element of the course. You, you never, if it's probably a decent examination, can, can ever quite figure out in advance in which direction the professor will approach the exam. You just need to have all the data so whatever way they approach it, you can spit back what's needed. I've done that with final exams. I think one of the neatest final exams I ever gave was uh, several years ago in a, in a class at Southern California College where I asked this question on the final exam. You have now sat through this course for one semester. This is your final exam. Put yourself in the professor's shoes. If you were writing the exam, what three questions would you ask that pertain to what has been developed in this course? And what answers would you give to those three questions? You will be graded on the quality of your selection of questions as well as the comprehensiveness of your answers. Oh, nasty test. They wrote for two solid hours. It was just wonderful. <laughs> and on those exams, I really picked up what students had learned or not learned in the class. This is that kind of a situation. It's final exam time. And Samuel, in real life, throws a question at Saul that says, when the going is tough, will you still obey God? That's the question. A command had been given. We don't even know what the command was. It was probably a command for Saul to wait no matter what until Samuel got there. But the command was given. Saul says, I appear to be justified by the circumstances. And yet he had a clear word from God, don't. And if we step outside of God's clear and known will, that we walk in the way of Saul and set ourselves up for failure. I might add that I think there may have been a second question on the exam 
It's not explicit in the text. But it's the question, if you, if you do step outside God's will, will you come back and ask for forgiveness and a second chance? Saul doesn't do that here. You should note that. In verses 14, 15, and on, he doesn't come back to God and ask for a second chance, and he doesn't say to Samuel, I'm sorry. I think his situation might have been profoundly different had he done that. And God took, takes one look at the composition of this man and says, there's a man that isn't after my heart. He's not willing to obey me, and when he does wrong, he's not willing to come to me and set it straight. Key to internal dynamics of success, walk in known obedience, or in walk in obedience to the known will of God. Second key step in success, and Saul illustrates it by failure, is when making a decision, anticipate the negative consequences of your decision. Don't be involved in hasty decisions. Consider the possible negative consequences. I would suspect that if I asked you, have you ever made a bad decision and regretted the consequences that flowed to you as a result of that decision, I'd get every hand here, unless you're very young and you'll soon be able to raise your hand. One of the worst decisions that I can recall making that I'm willing to share is the, uh, when we came out here in 1971, I was, uh, Jill and I were living with our two small children in Springfield, Missouri, where I was campus pastor at Evangel College, and the old timers in the church will know this story because I told it several years ago. And here we are coming out to Southern California and to a church that at that time was located in Newport Beach. Well, somehow my 69 red Chevy and and 68 Renault seemed to require uh, something more magnificent to pastor in Newport Beach. And unfortunately, I didn't have a salary to sustain what I wanted. And there was no problem with what I wanted if I could have sustained it and still kept my stewardship commitments. I, I believe that. But I started reading the used car ads in the newspaper, and then I finally found it. And I went down to see it. It was a block long, red and black, 1965 Cadillac, six years of age at the time, 18,000 miles. It was in such mint condition, outside and inside, that it looked like it had sat in a showroom all six years. I couldn't afford it. There was no way I could really make the payments, let alone the maintenance of that thing. But I said impulsively, I've got to have it. <laughs> and I got it. We were years digging out of that financial mistake. It burned more oil than it did gasoline. <laughs> it's like some people, it looked great on the outside, but it weren't put together on the inside. We do that with major purchases, don't we? Often we rush impulsively, and especially for the younger couples here. Don't do that. You'll be a while digging out of it. Saul, Saul makes that kind of a decision here. His decision in chapter 14, the background for it is that Saul is sitting under a pomegranate tree. He's gotten back to his home at Gabeah up in the mountains, just three miles north of Jerusalem, sitting under a pomegranate tree, doing what kings ought to do, sit under pomegranate trees and rule. And his son Jonathan is out on the cliffs trying to infiltrate enemy lines. And he does a magnificent job of it. And through scaling up a sheer cliff, he comes in upon a garrison of Philistines, knocks them out in Arnold Schwarzenegger fashion, or whatever his name is. And bang, the whole thing goes into rout. The Philistines, losing a few men, think that some mighty thing has smitten them, and they, they all go into panic, and the text says, God sent a panic among them. Saul stirs under his pomegranate tree and says, let's go for it. Let's chase them. 
And then he did a very stupid thing. He said, cursed is anyone who eats before sundown. That was his impulsive decision that didn't regard the negative consequences. And probably had good intentions. He thought, I got to keep these men pursuing the enemy while they're fleeing, and I don't have time for them to stop and get a Big Mac. It's going to take precious battle time. But he didn't anticipate several things. He didn't anticipate, for example, that the people that are doing the fighting under that hot Palestinian sky might need some nourishment during the day and they would even fight better if they had some nourishment. He didn't listen to the other side. In fact, the f it is substantiated in the text they needed nourishment because when Jonathan, his son, was walking along in that area chasing troops, he dips his staff into the ground where there is a honeycomb, brings up honey and tastes it and the text says his eyes became bright. You know what that is. That's a sugar lift. And I get it when I take a waxy covered chocolate donut and eat it. it. My eyes get bright. I just light up. I feel good all over. And I beg forgiveness from the dentists that are in the congregation, but boy, that just does something for me. And Saul flat out didn't read the consequences of saying to his guys under a hot day, don't eat. He deprived them of energy. He also didn't read the consequences that someone might not get the communication. He didn't have walkie-talkies or TV or sophisticated communications electronics equipment. It was word of mouth. Sure enough, somebody didn't get the communication. And that was his own son, Jonathan. He also didn't read the kind of actions that would happen when you let people starve all day long and when the sun sets and they've got all these spoils, what their eating habits are going to be like. They weren't as sophisticated and cultured and they didn't have Emily Post that had written a book at that time. So right as soon as the sun set, they said, it's okay to eat. And man, they fell among the animals and started eating them in a non-kosher way that was offensive to the code of Moses. And then the other thing that he didn't see is that the crime he imposed didn't, or the punishment he imposed didn't fit the crime. He said, cursed be anyone. Now that cursed means something far different than uh, saying a verbal thing to them. Cursed meant... You're dead. To be cursed is to be rubbed out. It's very clear from the text. He intended to do that with Jonathan. You are cursed when you ate that. You're gone, man. You're dead. The punishment didn't fit the crime. So here is a person who is heading along into failure because they're making decisions for which they have not thought through the consequences. And I submit to you that that's a relevant and contemporary problem in our lives. It could do with a major purchase. It can do with a decision to take a job before we really thought things through. It can relate to marriage. As a requirement in our, in our church, we have a rule that we ask couples that are being married in the church or under the auspices of a pastor go through at least, at least three counseling sessions with our counseling staff or attend the Engaged Couples Seminar, or do both as preparation for marriage. And we always have that situation where a couple, very much in the bloom of love, will say, we don't need that, we're in love. Anyone who's been married for a while knows that in addition to love in a marriage, you've got to have a lot of other things going for you. Because love, often in the courtship stage, is just good feelings and is illusory. And people all the time rush in to marriage relationships that they really haven't thought about and haven't anticipated the consequences of. And they get in decisions which are harmful. And Saul gets in one of those kinds of decisions and he sets into motion then the third thing that leads him into failure. And that third thing is he remains inflexible and unbending when there is a clear and obvious requirement that he change his position. He remains inflexible and unbending when there is a clear and obvious requirement 
that he change his position. And that clear and obvious requirement is now Jonathan stands before him, selected by Lot. He's the guy that ate the honey. And Saul looks at him and says, I've got to kill you to be true to my word. Maybe we ought to just pause for a moment and say, we're getting a look at a culture in the scriptures that put an important emphasis on keeping your word. And that's why people like Saul and before him, a few decades before him, a guy named Jephthah in Judges 11, when Jephthah was at war, he made a vow. If I win this battle, if God helps me to win, who, whatever comes out the door to meet me when I get home will be sacrificed. Whatever probably for him meant a goat or a, a cow, but it turns out to be his only daughter. And he sacrifices her. Saul should have learned from the example in his own national history not to make stupid vows, but he hadn't. But both Saul and Jephthah say, our word's important. Now, that's in such contrast to our society where you can never bank on anything anyone says unless it's attested by an affidavit and has three lawyers to witness it, and even then it might go to court and be reversed. Somehow we need to kind of get in the middle between the need for flexibility and the requirement of honor and keep your word. Saul said, I'm going to keep my word if it kills you. <laughs> and I submit to you that such a position is rigid and inflexible, shows a lack of capacity to change and to bend, and is not based upon love. Saul's rigidity was destroying his own family and threatened to destroy his own son. The character deficiency in rigidity is a lack of love. Love, if Saul were a loving person, he would find a way to admit that he made a mistake. He'd get up before his troops and say, you guys are right, I made the dumbest vow back there and I want God to release me and I want all of you to release me. I admit as king I'm not infallible. Please forgive me. He could have asked for forgiveness. Love would have asked for forgiveness. I'm so sorry, Jonathan, that I put you through all this terror. Can you imagine living, thinking your own dad is going to kill you? Love would have found a way to take on humiliation. Because for love, preserving a person is more important than keeping your own so-called honor. Saul could have even substituted himself or backed off and not pressed. Rigidity and inflexibility is seldom, if ever, prompted by love. Rigidity chokes and blocks creative abilities in ourself and someone else. Life is a call within the framework of absolute standards. It is a call to flexibility. I remember when our daughter Evangeline was small, was not yet walking. We were trying to impose upon her something that we found the strong-willed child did not accept. We had to learn to be flexible. She had one of these little walkers. She had not yet learned to walk, and she had this habit of walking on her toes. I don't know how we got this, but we, were, we, were, we very much knew as young parents that if she walked on her toes instead of on her heels and using her old foot, it would ruin her for life. She would suffer grave consequences later in her life with a back out of joint or something. And it was just a horrendous clash of wills to try to get that child to walk on her feet rather than her toes. Fortunately, I think we finally let her go. At least she's normal today, so we must have. And sometimes we do that with children, don't we? We read something in a book or we see how another parent is doing it and we say, that's going to work in my home. If it kills me and you both, we're going to do it. And we don't match the unique circumstances and needs that may be facing us in our individual situation and apply some good flexibility. Saul got into grave trouble because he didn't. Rigidity always gets people into trouble. What are the internal dynamics of success? They're to first walk in obedience to the Lord. Secondly, to evaluate carefully the consequences of your decisions. 
Choose your rut well, as my dad used to say. You will be in it for the next 20 miles. That was a slogan out of the, out of the mud days of dirt roads in western Pennsylvania when you had those cars that didn't have paved highways and after the rain, you want to choose your rut well. You'll be in it for a while. And third, develop a flexibility based on love. Having your own way could be the very worst thing to happen to you and to someone else. It was for Saul. Fascinating to see as we look at the personality of Saul and an encouragement for us because God's got some different principles operating on us than evidently he did with Saul because he gives us more than one chance. Seventy times seven is what the Lord said. But it's encouraging when you read the story of Saul and find that it says that the Lord rejected him, that Saul nevertheless kept on being king. In fact, Acts tells us he was king for 40 years. Which means that in rejecting him, God was specifically rejecting his dynasty and God was never rejecting Saul on a personal level. He was rejecting him from a position that would be passed on to his family, but God did not reject that man in 1 Samuel 13 and 14 on the personal level. And I think it's an open question in Scripture as to whether Saul was ever rejected as a person. Because God has high regard for us as people. Be a success. Walk in God's will. Evaluate your decisions and the consequences thereof and stay flexible out of love. Our Lord, we come to you now in a moment of dedication and prayer and ask that the Holy Spirit would search our hearts and make us to conform to the wonderful personality of Jesus of Nazareth. If, Lord, as we pray, we can identify areas of our life where we are walking in disobedience to you, we ask that for your help that we may be placed back in a position of obedience to you. We're so glad, Lord, that you do forgive us and you do not reject us. For those in this congregation who are on the verge of making important and major decisions which they are going to live with for years, May you give them a special grace and wisdom to pray that decision through and to think it through so that the, that decision might be lived out well and be for your honor and glory. And give us with one another, Lord Jesus, wonderful flexibility based on love. Help us, Lord, to have the attitude that it is more important to love than it is to be right. And help us to keep in balance the proper proportion of adherence to truth and being right and adherence to love and caring for another person. We sometimes, Lord, do not always know where those distinctions are. And we need the help of your Holy Spirit to show us. I pray especially also for parents who are struggling with children and who at one moment do not know how flexible they should be. I pray that you'll give them great understanding and insight from you. May the time we spend in your word and on our knees illumine us and give us direction. Help us, Lord, to do differently than Saul, who was willing to sacrifice his child on the altar of inflexibility. Guard our homes and our hearts. We ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.